welcome to Clothing Culture. I'm Emily Lane. I'm Brett Schnetker. We speak with experts where we explore the global dynamics that shape trends in the fashion industry. Brought to you by Stars Design Group, a global production and design house with over 30 years of industry experience. Welcome back to another episode of Clothing Culture. Today, we are going to be exploring the topic of the rise of the boutique brand economy. Welcome back, Brett. Hey, thanks, Emily. So that sounds like a pretty fancy title, boutique brand economy. What does that mean? You know, it's interesting. I would say that, you know, it's sort of an analogous to, you know, farm to table in the food industry, micro breweries to the big, you know, brands, it's, it's finding its way into the apparel industry. And I think that, you know, there's, there's a lot of excitement with Gen Z for brands that have a story to tell that are, you know, uh, fresh faces in the industry that, um, that are learning to bootstrap and develop, you know, what they consider niches that are voids in the industry and support you know, a lot of them are supporting social agendas. And, you know, it's kind of an exciting space. I think for a long time, a lot of the industry um, looked pretty similar. And with this rise of this new boutique economy, there's a lot of intelligent, you know, production going on. And certainly there's some that's not so intelligent, but But I think that, you know, that's a learning curve for a lot of those different groups. But there's some that really, you know, very innovative. When you talk about some that maybe aren't so intelligent, what are some key things that they're missing? It's experience mainly. They see an opportunity when they dive into the business. Some of, many of them, you know, we've talked to have never been in the apparel business before. Mm -hmm. And I think that people simplify this business. They simplify the manufacturing aspects and the technical aspects. And I think shortly into their apparel life, they start to recognize some of those important key features that, that, you know, they'll need to adjust on the fly, certainly. Yeah, I've definitely seen a couple of those scenarios where they either come into the industry for the kind of the sexiness and allure, Mm. you know, thinking about the high fashion days and, you know, the images in Vogue magazine and that gets everybody kind of excited. But then there's also some, as you say, that kind of oversimplify it. And they're like, oh, you know, I can, I can innovate this hoodie. I can do a better yoga pant or, you know, and I think that there lies a big problem in not having that distinct voice because as you were talking about, people want to connect with these brands. Mm-hmm. And so if they're coming in with a game plan of, you know, I, I've looked at the price of yoga pants and wow, I could produce something and make a little detail, make it better. Yeah. You know, it kind of creates this false sense of what it really takes to create a successful business. Yeah. In many cases, I think so. Yeah. So what are some, what are, what's some kind of key advice that you would give as somebody came to you and said, I've got the next great idea. I, I want to get into this industry. I, I, I have a powerful story to tell. I'm going to align with this great mission. I already have an audience. You know, how do I get going at this? Yeah, I think the answer would probably vary based upon their experience and expertise in the apparel field. You know, we've, like I mentioned before, I think we find a lot that are new to mm-hmm. that field. And I think really doing a deep dive on a business plan. Look, I'm a creative at heart. My, my experience in history, uh, early history in, in the apparel business was certainly creative. Um, but I learned over time to really appreciate the importance of numbers and planning. And it's not that a business plan is all numbers, but really asking yourself those challenging questions about you know, is this niche really uh, a niche that other that others will resonate with? You know, thinking through all those steps because it is, you know, it it is a challenging industry. There's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of people vying for that end consumer's heart and mind, 
And I think you've got to really think through your strategy effectively. Most of the time, you know, we don't really think about those investments into apparel, but I mean, a typical investment size can be, you know, certainly as minimum as a nice car, but can be equal to over a year or two, a pretty sizable house. Mm -hmm. And so you don't go into those decisions lightly. And I think taking the time to understand and develop, even though those plans change, mm -hmm. you know, people believe, why should I bother with this plan in a startup? Because I really don't know what the answer is going to look like a year from now. That's not really the purpose of a plan. It's about some guidance. It's about understanding your mission statement, your vision statement. What am I, you know, you know, I'm, I'm, they're the steward of their plan and their future and their, and their brand. And I think those plans help them identify. I'd say that's a really important first step. I agree with you. I've worked with many startup ventures throughout the years. And every time you bring up the importance of a business plan, it just kind of everybody kind of deflates their, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, oh, you know, they get deflated yes. by this and, and, and look at it with kind of uh, this loom of <laughs> terror. <Yeah. laughs> but it is so important because it really helps you take a real hard look at the industry, the opportunity, you know, how your niche fits into that opportunity, it helps you map out your voicing and your brand, all of which is becoming, it's always been important, but more important, I think, now than ever because of this desire for people to connect with the brand. So really understanding who you are and how you're different is key. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, sometimes technologies change which open the door for opportunities and I think our industry and economy that technology has evolved where the online business has become more relevant than at any time ever before certainly COVID you know accelerating some of that but at the same time that door opens to that technology and the ability for more people at different levels to to interact directly with a customer. We call it DTC, direct to customer business. Um, it also presents its own set of unique challenges. You've got a lot of people going down that path. So you've got, you know, it's become a science as you know today to separate yourself and your voice from others for sure. What are some common misconceptions? I think the most evident that comes to my mind is, you know, I build it, they will come. I have a great idea. I'm going to go out, throw it on the internet, and people are going to come in mass and buy this, this particular item or concept or brand or whatever. Um, I don't think there's a substitute for time in most businesses. Um, building brand equity is important, and that takes kind of a consistent interaction and communication with your customer and it needs to be consistent over time. Right. So I think that's a really key one. The second one is this This business is easy. Mm -hmm. I can right. go to Alibaba, I can connect with a complete no-name stranger, I can show them a drawing and they're going to deliver me a product that's going to be marketable and, and, and meet my requirements. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a growing requirement for quality. And I think that today more than ever, that one to five star rating, that immediate, feedback from the customer kind of makes or breaks you. And so really understanding, partnering with uh, someone that really understands these different elements, uh, critical elements of the garment business um, can, can be important. And mm -hmm. I think that comes down to the fit or spec of a garment, the translation of that fit to the consumer, the different quality attributes that kind of match the demographic that you're going after. Right. Um, those, those are pretty common misconceptions that, or things that people don't really spend a lot of time thinking about as a startup right. if they don't have a ton of experience in this industry. You, you mentioned fit, and I look at some of the companies that we've um, looked at and that have were looking for advice on how to improve their product and so many of them have made the mistake early on about not making good fit decisions yeah. <laughs> you know using themselves as fit models because they're the perfect large right. or you know and then scaling out from there 
Um, so that is, I can see a, a critical, a critical one. What's some advice that you have for people in that space of fit? Yeah, it's interesting. I think for years when we were in a brick and mortar environment, vanity sizing ran amok, mm -hmm. you know, um, let's make Everybody you feel good about it. Everybody wants to be a zero. Everyone, yeah, everyone, <laughs> I don't know if I want to be a zero, but, uh, but I get your point. Yeah. Um, I certainly like to be a couple sizes down from what I am, but I think, um, you know, in a brick and mortar environment, that can be effective. You make people feel good about themselves, uh, albeit what we call what fake news, probably. <laughs> right. But I think when you get into an online environment, um, that doesn't serve an equal purpose. In fact, it can work against you. I think returns, some cases, some reports as high as 20%. 20 to 30 even. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can really devastate profitability on those items that are returned. So controlling return rates and making sure the customer certainly is satisfied so they're giving you a four and five star ratings is more important. And mm -hmm. so fit is something to really concentrate on. And transparency and of. And transparency and communication yeah. of that fit. And I think, you know, Working with a competent person on fit, employing companies out there that bring science to fit, like Alvanon. They're mm -hmm. an amazing company. They scan thousands of bodies around the world using algorithms to create kind of these unique body types and information to ensure that, you know, the majority of customers that you're, you're uh, you know, selling to are happy with fit is important and then there's a ton of technologies today that are occurring um, although they're in their infancy and I think that you know that technology is going to improve over time is these you know you take your phone you take a photograph of your body it automatically calculates your your measurements and then it it tells you based upon specific brands that have put the information into that mm -hmm. particular branded technology you know, what size you should fit. My and fit, right? My mm -hmm. fit's one of them, There's a, or my size, I think. Oh, There's size. a number of them that, that are out there that, that are evolving. And I think with the technology growth that we've got in our phones today, the latest generations are using LiDAR technology, which is kind of a 3D scanning uh, kind of attribute. You can, it really helps read those surfaces and shapes much more effectively. And I think that will go a long way to help mm -hmm. improve some of the fit challenges. Continuing down this path of some of these mis misconceptions, <clears throat> we heard um, a new company uh, say that luck, they were depending on mm -hmm. luck mm -hmm. to, you know, th to be a part of the formula of success. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think that they're not alone in that. Sure. Yeah. Certainly lucky genes thought so, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, I, I would say that while luck can play a part in it, mm -hmm. that's an exception to the rule. I think that I would not put in my business plan that luck is going to get me where I need to go. Mm -hmm. um, the stories that I have heard about a number of brands, big and small, if you go back in history, it's about hard work, perseverance, um, uh, 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 laser focus on, yeah. on what you wanna do, um, a laser focus on brand stewardship over a period of time and doing that consistently and well and developing an audience um, and continuing to resonate with an audience over years mm -hmm. is really more of a uh, signal of success than luck. Right, I mean, it's it's with any business. Sure. It's having realistic expectations about how long it takes to be a viable and profitable business. Yeah. You know, three years, five years is not uncommon to, to make that mark where you're able to sleep at night. Right, <laughs> right for sure. Right, so I, I think another kind of interesting topic, um, you know, we, we, we've had conversations with startups. Uh, they'll say things like, I'd like to make, make sure and manufacture in the United States because I'm going to get a better quality product. You know, yeah. I think that would be one of those in that misconception category. I think depending on the category, I think there are certain industries that the United States has protected and grown. Um, I, I'm going to do some advertising, you know, Ford Motor Company. I look at them and I think over the years, when I look at the technology built into Ford Motor Cars, they're impressive. I mean, they build a good car. Um, but in the apparel industry, America really abdicated 
the apparel business years ago. And while there are competent manufacturers in the United States. Absolutely. We is, know many of them, yes, actually. Yeah. It's not an industry that is a strong, robust, vibrant industry in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And so it has its limitations. One of those limitations are labor cost. Mm -hmm. You know, in apparel, it's one of the categories that have not had an inflationary increase in cost since, I think, the 80s. Um, How is and that possible? It's astounding. <laughs> and so it puts a lot of downward pressure on costing. You know, everyone talks about how glamorous the business is, and certainly at certain levels, it can be. You know, mm -hmm. there's some really great brands out there that can use some fantastic fabrics, but the mass part of our economy is managing labor cost um, in, we're generally in third world countries or mm -hmm. developing nations where apparel is an important part of their you know, industrial path. Right. And so, you know, I think when you look at made in America as a concept for apparel, the garments will tend to be very, very expensive. And then there's just limitations on fabrics and, mm -hmm. and, and expertise on a mass mark in the U.S. So I think, right. you know, you have to make your decisions. If that's part of your value chain made in America, then I think strategizing and organizing your partners along that vein would be really important. Absolutely. So having an understanding that not manufacturing in America doesn't mean reduced quality. It's just a different value. Well, it is, and I think that's also changing. You know, really talking about Made in America, one of the exciting parts uh, of what's occurring, um, you know, even here in St. Louis, is with the advance in technology, there can be the ability to nearshore some apparel manufacturing. You know, it's a big conversation today about nearshoring, bringing Absolutely. businesses that have been long gone in the U.S. back to the U.S. Um, there's a company here in St. Louis called Evolution Manufacturing, you know, good um, really friends innovation. of ours and good, good relationships. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're certainly an investor in that, in that group. But they've, you know, they've invested in, I think, the latest, greatest technology, you know, under one roof with stole knitting machines um, mm -hmm. and whole garment knitting. And I think it minimizes... The, the labor cost in general and allows us to be more competitive in, in, in addition to really doing some amazing things that, you know, that these machines can do that you can't typically do in other parts of the world. Thinking about these boutique brands that are on the rise, are there any that are in your mind that you've seen kind of grow up along the way and feel are really doing it right that could be good examples for people to look at? I'm a tech junkie. So, you know, companies like Vala back out of the UK, mm. uh, Ministry of Supply, you know, they're MIT guys. Um, personally, those are brands that I really, I really have an affinity toward because they're using some mind blowing technologies that exist in fabrics um, and changing kind of that landscape of that. But mm -hmm. I mean, there's just an endless supply of these other brands that that represent different niches in the industry. And it's just many kinds, too, too many to tell, but um, there's a lot of them that I really respect. Well, thank you for sharing your insights. Do you have any other thoughts you would like to impart on those who are pondering the early stages here of maybe starting their own brand? I think I would urge them to really be methodical about that thought process. You know, mm -hmm. emotions can run high when you want to start a new business. And, and this is just like other businesses. It takes a real methodical approach and a, a intense um, uh, focus on partnerships to ensure that your vision becomes real. So I think that's really important as you start. Great advice. Well, thanks again for joining. Make sure to subscribe as we are going to be discussing this topic in a little greater detail in an upcoming episode. Thanks, Emily.